the gremlins, the gods of the gods of the internet decided that they didn't want us to make it work. But anyway, here we are. And uh, today we just wanted to talk about a concept that I describe as Star Wars clones. What does it mean to train like that? Well, what's a Star Wars clone? Basically what it is, it's a clone. It's exactly the same. One clone is the same as the next. And what that means is, when you learn a technique, or a combination, or a skill, or a principle, there's generally one right way to go about it. Okay, us guys, our apologies, we had a lot of trouble connecting today for some reason. You know, uh, and we're having to do it now because the, the, the uh, internet on the computer didn't work, so we're shooting this on the mobile phone. So if it's a bit funky, that's why. In fact, I'm gonna move. I'm back again. Us, Thomas, Dwayne. Happy birthday to Dwayne. Was it your 64th recently? 63rd or 64th? Look, we're having a little bit of trouble, guys, with the connection. Please forgive us. We'll do what we can to keep it going. The Star Wars clone theory is that a clone is exactly the same, exactly the same, exactly the same. It doesn't mean that everyone's karate ends up being exactly the same, does it? Oof. What did Solzai say? He actually said there is no the karate. karate. There's Cameron karate, there's Mitchell karate, there's Thomas karate. Yeah, there's Matus karate. karate. There's everyone's, in, in an in, where that comes from was, um, I was translating for an interview, or in, interpreting for an interview with Solzai in uh, the USA once. And one of the interviewers said, what is Kyokushin Karate? And Solzai said, there is no Kyokushin Karate. And he kind of looked at him. He said, what do you mean? He said, there's Michael Karate, Cameron Karate, Stephen Karate. Everyone's Karate is unique. And that was actually quite a profound thing to say. Having said that, if you've ever trained with Solzai, you'll know that he was very, very adamant about there being one correct way to do a technique. So would repeat the same thing over and over. Get the elbow in, get the elbow in, close the waki, close the waki, close the waki, get the chin back, posture, close the waki, get the eyes forward. He would repeat this over and over and over and over because he said, well, I've just got to keep repeating it until you get it right. Okay, so there's only one right way. So this is what we mean when we say train like a Star Wars clone. It means there's an exact way to do it. Why? Why would that be the way it's done? I think because more than likely it's been tested by your lineage before you, the people teaching you have tested it. It's been trial, trial and error, different ways to do things and they've narrowed it down to this is the most probable, highly likely way that you've got success using these, this particular technique at this time, is my guess. I think you're probably right. I reckon the, the key there is trial and error. Because what happens is, with the trial and error, you work out what really works and what doesn't against a, a non-compliant opponent. And it's very, very important that those giants whose shoulders we stand on have tested it in various circumstances against a non-compliant opponent. And the whole idea of, of trial and error is that you constantly eliminate the forms of the skill that you're working on that don't work anymore. Yeah. Or the forms of the skill that are inefficient or prove themselves to be less effective. And I think that's where having a great instructor and a great lineage comes from as well because what if you're with someone that um, hasn't necessarily tested it, they've just learnt it, um, whether they haven't done tournaments or they haven't had actual confrontation or they haven't spent time in a certain range, how do you really know what's happening? So I think that's a very important thing to the instructor in the dojo. I think it's a good point. And this morning I had breakfast with a mate of mine, Will. Out to Will. We were talking about 
the problem with a lot of traditional martial arts that don't pressure test. Uh, or different martial arts, for example, that don't compete. They don't have a... Um, they don't have a competition form that replicates in some degree or another uh, reality. And quite often, what, and I've known them, I've seen them over the years, there's different, all kinds of people say, well, we don't compete because our techniques are too dangerous. We don't compete because the techniques we're taught are always illegal. You can think of a thousand different reasons why you don't compete, but I can give you one really good one. It's the only way you can pressure test against a non-compliant opponent without going out there and beating up someone. Being a bully, yeah. And there are different types of competition. There's Kyokushin, which is bare fist, no punches to the face, but you can kick to the face, elbow to the body, punch to the body, kick to the leg. So it offers a very high degree of reality, namely if you don't have your level of resilience up, you're in big, big trouble. Okay, that sturdiness uh, factor, quality, that's, yeah. that, that somatic it. quality is very, very important. Then you have boxing, kickboxing, wrestling, BJJ, uh, Muay Thai, all these are sports. But you can't tell me that because they're a sport, it weakens the quality of what they do. Definitely it's not. It improves it, I think. In, it definitely exposes the exponents to a degree of non-compliance. Whereas those people who argue that we don't compete simply don't compete simply because what we do is too dangerous, they've never exposed themselves to real non-compliance. Uh, so therefore, they never really know. And you know, there's that case of the, the uh, MMA fighter in China who goes around challenging the masters of the different I've traditional that, yeah. arts. Yeah. Well, no one, no one does the beauty of those arts, but definitely he has proven that if you don't expose yourself to a non-compliant opponent, all you're doing is actually talking a whole lot of... Kind of deluding yourself yes, when push it, comes to shove. That's true, it's a form of delusion. Okay, so the reason I describe it as Star Wars clones is when I teach the students something, I want them to do it exactly in a particular way. Mitch knows. For many years, Mitch trained with us. He was a live-in student. And we would drill it in. Uh, let me show you a couple of examples. I'll look after this. So... The first example, a simple example that I might give, is the idea of a combination, a punch combination. It might be a one, a two, and a liver shot. One, two, liver. Okay? So you say to people, we're doing a punch to the jaw, backhand at the jaw, and a backhand at the liver. And there's a thousand different ways they can do it. And they may end up going one, two, three. One, two, three, something like this. But we go, okay, no, let's do it like a Star Wars clone. So, for the first thing we do is, I like to have the hand facing me. I was taught to punch like that by former world champion, Barry Michael, elbow in. It's like I'm reading cheat notes. Okay, throw the punch. It's, it's a bad angle here looking at the camera because it exposes my jaw. So here's a good thing. Again, Star Wars clone, when you use a mirror, angle yourself at the mirror so that it doesn't weaken your technique. Then check your technique, then go back to the technique without looking at the mirror. You should never train with yourself looking in a mirror. You check your technique looking in a mirror, then you look away from the mirror, then you go back. Why? Because when you look in the mirror, it's a very subtle thing, but it takes your biofeedback into the image that you're looking at. Okay? So what we want to do is one, two. So when I throw the one, two, I go one, two, and back. I don't go one, two. One, two. That's Wars clone, the Star Wars clone is it all goes in. When I throw the left, my shoulder is on my jaw. See that? 
my shoulder is on my jaw. There. When I throw the right, again my head stays straight. Now if I add the nine to it, now I want to do a rip. It's really important that I go one, two, and what I like to do here is come forward so that my shoulder is on their elbow. Watch, one, two, I even drop the hand here. People say there's no point in doing this. One, two, the hand is set up for the rip straight away. I was taught that by a kickboxer named Bain Stewart. I trained Bain, who was Australian heavyweight kickboxing champion. Great boxer, and he would do that naturally. Boom. Okay, so we're here. One, two, three. That's a one, two, oh, that's one, two, nine. One, two, nine. Okay, it's not a Star Wars clone, and if you do that in the ring against a non compliant opponent, you open yourselves up to all sorts of disaster. Okay, so instead, we develop the habit. One, we teach the students to do it in an exact way. Two, when I do it, my jaw is on my shoulder, my shoulder is on my jaw, and the hand comes here, and then break the rhythm so my shoulder goes to their elbow, and my hand here is set up for the nine, and then I take the weight, excuse me, into the nine. So, I'm not saying it's the only way, but this is the Star Wars clone way that I teach. One, two, three. It's important that I get the broken rhythm. One, two, the shoulder comes forward there. So now I have the distance, so I'll get Mitch to stand in. So I'm here like this. It's really, I might turn around this way so you can see my shoulder. Okay, so it might be like this. Mitch throws a punch at me. One, knock it down. Throw the right, and what I need to do is bring my shoulder forward. Okay, one, because the shoulder protects me. Two, because it allows me to throw the punch into the rib. So we're here. Mitch maybe throws a, a, a left right. One, two, one, two, and look, this is why I bring the hand here and the shoulder, my elbow, my shoulder to his elbow. See that? I need to be forward like this because it kind of takes me out of danger. I throw the rib, he throws the hook. I come underneath the hook, come back. Okay, so the one, two, one, two, one, two. Move my shoulder forward and rip, okay? So, when I practice that like a Star Wars clone now, I go one, two, keep my shoulder forward, three. Okay, so, the idea that we're trying to gem demonstrate to you is I'm not saying that's the only way to uh, throw a one, two, nine. What I'm saying is if I teach it in that way, you need the students to do it exactly like that because that is the way that I have found to be uh, most useful and realistic and practical, you know. Uh, and it teaches all those things that you speak about. Technique, elbows in, chin in, head, dominant head position, rhythm, rhythm, timing, all those things. Out of the dead zone, yeah. off to the side, exactly. So, so that's all combined in that fundamental that you teach. And I guess decades down the track or thousands of reps down the track, someone could modify that. Oh, it's Andrea. Nice to see you, man. He's one of my heroes, Andrea Stopper. Yeah, I've heard you talk about him. Yeah, I talk about Andrea. He's Multiple like black belts. Black Belt Judo, Black Belt BJJ, Black Belt Kyokushin uh, has fought just a bunch of things. One day when I grow up, I want to be just like you, Andrea. Us. Okay, so another example for, say, Star Wars clone will be what I call the Cox Comb. Okay, so the Cox Comb essentially is my defense against a head kick. So if the head kick comes in this direction, I need to make sure that my cox comb is up. I use this metacarpal, I believe, oh, yeah. here. It's really important, you see, I have this bone. Now this is the Star Wars clone bit. It's not just, yeah, I've got my hand up. No, you don't, you don't have your hand up because if you get a full power shin kick and your hand's like that, you'll still get knocked out because your wrist and hand will collapse into your face. 
So the Star Wars clone says it must be this bone here. And that way, if the kick comes, it's not collapsing. So when we teach the cox comb, that's why it's called cox comb on the top of your head like the comb on top of a rooster's head. Okay, my elbow is vertical, my thumb comes up, and when I lock the kick, it's like a baseball grip. There, the cox comb. That's not the block, that's the insurance policy. There's the block. So if, if uh, Mitch swings his arm as though it's a kick, that's the block. This is the backup. And if he mistimed, tricks me, miss it, boom, and I miss it, I still have the hand up. There, like that. Boom. The cox comb must be done in a very particular way. Not like this, with my body open. Not like that, with the wrong bone on my head. It must be done exactly like that. Jaw forward, shoulder forward, there, so that when I pick it up, I pick it up strong. They're just some examples of what we mean. Okay, they're examples. They're examples of what we mean by Cox, uh, by um, Star Wars clone. You have to do things in a very particular way. When you grapple, by the way, it's even easier to see. If you don't do things in a particular way, uh, it just doesn't work. Um, for example, if, if Mitch stays there, stay there, and I'm going to turn around, I'm going to do, just do a, a, um, a rear naked choke. This works, this works, this works. They all work until they don't work. So the first thing is, I get my arm around, then I bring this up, my arm, and Mitch gets it, and bang, I break my arm. So the Star Wars clone says, don't expose your arm. So the next thing I want to do is keep this hand hidden. So instead of coming here, putting on my bicep and then going behind, in which case Mitch would take my arm, twist it towards the thumb, and next thing you know, I'm going to have to tap or break an arm. Okay, so I'm in this position. I keep my head close. I don't keep my head here. Why not? Because Mitch is just going to go bang with a headbutt. Boom, back like that. If I'm like this, he headbutts back, breaks my nose. So I keep my head close. Now he can't headbutt me. Now this hand comes to here, and I pat my own hand, and I slide it through. Then I grip, then I squeeze, then I rotate, down. Okay? There's a very specific way. Of course, there's a dozen, half a dozen different ways that you can do it, and they'll all work under a degree of non-compliance. But if you really want to find a technique that works more times than others, I won't say all the time, because nothing works 100% of the time. If you want to find a technique that works more time, if you want to find a technique that doesn't expose you to the dangers of being counted, another thing about this too is if I'm here and I go put my hand on the head like that, see that? Mitch just reaches over and pulls my hand off. Okay, if I want to put my hand behind, I turn my palm. So now when Mitch pulls my palm, he actually pulls it into his own head. But I don't even leave it behind the head. I bring it, I bring it all the way to the opposite shoulder, like that. So once again, the Star Wars clone way that I do the rear naked is based on a series of trial and error do it like that, oh, it pulls my hand off, pulls my hand off, oh, I'm not going to do it like that, how do I fix it? So my coach says, well, no, actually, you go, okay, well, that works better now. But still, there's a little bit of space. So I'm going to come around, oh, break my arm, oh, break my arm, how many times have I got my arm broken before I go, well, that's a bit silly, so let's not expose the hands, and let's, let's boom, let's slide it this way. Okay, and the next thing you know, through a series of non, of, uh, trial and error experiences with an increasing degree of non-compliance, what you get is a Star Wars clone way of doing something. And you teach your students that way. You can say, look, there's this way, this way, this way, but inevitably your chances of making it work those ways are less than they are if you do it this way. And that's where we as students get to stand on the shoulder of giants who have iterated that many times in all those situations. Yes, exactly. The karate that we do, of course, goes back many, many years. And 
what you have is the masters who develop, for example, certain way to do kata, certain way to retract hands, certain way to do certain blocks. Why does Salsai go, well, when you, when you bring your hand up, you have the finger tip on the tip of the ring finger. I've actually watched recently a goju kata, they actually do it opposite. Well, their reason may be very good, but Salsai's reason, reason makes sense. When you come up like that, it's on the ring finger. When you go to the side, it's on the middle finger. And Salsai was adamant, no, put it on your middle finger. Don't just beat around the bush and do it any old way. Be a Star Wars clone. And I think uh, that's another way of saying do it exactly as it's taught. But then there's a dilemma, right? Be a clone, but have your own karate. So where do you find the step off? Where do you go from being a clone to developing your own karate? That's a good question. Do you do, that? Do you have a similar situation in, in physical athletic development yeah, absolutely. where you teach someone to do something and then immediately they go off and do it their own way? <laughs> do their own thing straight away. It's yeah. like, oh, that's not exactly how it yeah, goes. Yeah. Yeah. But there is a time when they can go, all right, I'm gonna do it differently. But I think perhaps the key to that is based on their own I was going to say personal experience, their own trial and error. Yeah. Based on their own trial and error, they may, and, you know, sometimes technique will change because of physiological differences. Absolutely. Someone's got really long legs, short arms. Someone's got really long arms, short legs. legs. Someone has a stronger back. Someone has stronger They're legs. They're more quite and rounded. Right. Yeah. You know, so, of course, then, once they learn the exact way to do it, you can do what you want after that. You can make the changes as you see fit. It's the same with karate. So also I said, there is no Kyokushin. There's Mitch Karate, Cameron Karate, Andrea Karate, like that. Okay, so what happens is you drill and drill and drill and you do it in exact way and exact way and exact way. And then you adapt not so much the technique, but the timing, the angles, the distance, the little things like that. You adapt where you introduce that particular technique into the fighting, okay? That's where you make the differences. And I think it's really valuable to know that there is a stepping off point from being a clone to creating your own karate. But first and foremost, if you go around anywhere in the world and train in any Kyokushin Dojo, there, also I said, there is only one correct way to do a particular technique. Okay, and this is the beauty of what Solsai said. You know, he said there's only one right, right way to do a technique, but if the way you do it knocks them out, that's the right way. So that's the, that balance between being a Star Wars clone and having your own karate. You start off, you, the reason we go to a dojo and learn under a master is because they, it saves an awful lot of time. Yeah. Imagine if every time you wanted to learn how to fight, you started from zero yourself. It's like... You never get anything done. You never get anything done. All the great fighters in the world, in any style, in any form of fighting, spend a lot of time at the feet of the master learning the particular skills before they develop their own style. And there's that good saying, there's no shortcuts to success. Everyone's got to pay full price. And I think that doing those reps and those reps and those reps, like you say, at the foot of the master is, uh, is critical for that. Yes. So to sum up what we mean by Star Wars clone, Salsai says there's an exact way. You go to any dojo in the world, and some dojos can't say that this is right, and another dojo can't. Everyone, there is an exact way that you need to work on your basic techniques. There's an exact way you should move. Later on, under pressure against a non-compliant opponent, if you can make your way to move, that's okay. If you can make that work, that's fine. But as teachers, you will find that there is a universally correct way to do something. And you walk into a dojo, the way the instructor teaches, he wants everybody to do it in exactly the right way. When they're a second down, third down, fourth down, they can make the changes. But until then, they have to be like the Star Wars clone and do it exactly the same. And the kata, that's one of the reasons why we do kata, because kata is a form of Star Wars clone training. Everybody does it, and you know when you, you Watch a team of people doing kata. It's all exactly the same. 
And that's what gives it its skill and strength and beauty. You don't have different people doing different things and they go, well, you know, I just decided. I have seen that. I have trained with people who've gone, yeah, no, I, I, I do the stance differently. You know, and you ask them, what degree of non-compliance have they exposed that to? And invariably the answer is none. I do it differently. I stand differently. But it's I so don't. easy to have that belief, that attitude towards kata or a lot of these things if you haven't tested yourself, right? Yes. Because you can easily become deluded. Yes. It's so easy to go off track. 100%. When you have been <laughs> tested, you're, you're more likely to stay on track. Yeah. And, of course, there's that uh, martial arts problem where people deliberately don't test themselves because they let the stripes on their belt do the talking and they go and they try to convince people that they are masters of non-compliance um, because they have a fourth down, fifth down, sixth down, seventh down, eighth down, ninth down, twelfth down. You know, that's meant to convince people they know what they're doing. But you just take green belt, can walk up and just go, oh, well, let's just pressure test, see what you've got. That's the key, pressure testing. Start as a Star Wars clone, trial and error, trial and error, trial and error, drill, 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 but keep drilling with improvement. The Japanese concept of Kaizen. My good buddy, Ryan Fiorenzi, shout out to Ryan, has a dojo called the Kaizen Dojo. Oh, cool. Yeah, Kaizen, the Japanese concept of incremental small improvements. You never let, so I said, you, you can never stand still. You're either going backwards or going forwards. So keep moving forwards. And that's what Kaizen means. Pressure test, but keep pressure a little bit. Tweak, 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 tweak all the time. That's what I mean by uh, Star Wars clone. And we were gonna talk about the Dojo Kun, but we might do that next week. Awesome. We had a really good, um, people in part of my Budo blueprint, we had a good couple of hours discussion about uh, the, the Dojo Kun. Some yeah, fantastic it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, it was really insightful. Yeah, Two hours was, on it. It was, it was really good. So, uh, and that's, you know, everybody who took part really contributed a lot of really good stuff. So that's where we go. Guys, thank you very much. Be like a Star Wars clone. And if you don't know what I mean by that, then always ask what is the exact way to do a technique? What is the exact flow in a, in a grappling situation? Where do I put first, then second, then third, then fourth, then the angle, da, da, da. It's like when you do an armbar, if you try to get the arm bar before you got control of the arm, or if you try to do a heel hook or ankle lock before you get control of the leg, that's not the Star Wars way of doing it. You have to make sure that you do things exactly as they've been taught. Okay, thanks guys. Mitch, awesome. good to see you. Thank you. We've got our swimming pool. Look, that's where we're going now. We're gonna go and have a swim. Appreciate you all coming along, guys. What's Rob? Good to see you. Mac. I hope you got that message about the uh, where to find the um, the nine week program. Us. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. See you again soon. Us.